No matter what else is happening in the world. There is always good news today. Welcome to Good News Today, the program where you will always find good news no matter what else is happening in the world. I'm Mark Teske, your host for Good News Today. I want to thank you for joining us. We've got a great program. Here's what's coming up. We're going to begin with our devotional time, and that consists of a scripture reading, beautiful singing, and a brief study of that scripture. Today we'll be looking at Acts chapter 22, verses 12 through 16 where we learn what washed away the sins of Saul of Tarsus and what didn't wash away his sins. So get out your Bibles, turn to Acts 22. I'll meet you there in just a moment. Following our devotional time, we head over to the workshop where Troy Spradlin will be explaining what the gospel can't do. Jim Dearman will join us with some sound words about baptism being a burial. Freddie Clayton then visits the pastime porch, and he's answering the question, who can be saved? Chad Dollahite joins us for just a minute, and he's explaining something else that's connected to Jesus, his baptism. In our final segment, we have a Bible question for Anthony Dismuke and Troy Spradlin. Does God forgive me even if I don't forgive myself? It's a great question. I'm sure you're going to want to stick around and hear what the Bible says about that. Well, I hope you have your Bibles opened up to Acts 22, where we read beginning at verse 12. Then a certain Ananias, a devout man according to the law, having a good testimony with all the Jews who dwelt there, came to me, and he stood and said to me, Brother Saul, receive your sight. At that same hour I looked up at him. Then he said, The God of our fathers has chosen you, that you should know his will, and see the just one, and hear the voice of his mouth. For you will be his witness to all men of what you have seen and heard. And now, why are you waiting? Arise and be baptized and wash away your sins, calling on the name of the Lord. There's a message true and glad for the sinful and the sad. Bring it out. Bring it out. Bring it out. Bring it out. It will give and encourage you. It will help them to be true. Bring it out. 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 Here in Acts chapter 22, Paul is in Jerusalem, and he's been assaulted by the Jews who were trying to kill him. Roman soldiers came and intervened, and, and the beatings stopped. Paul is being carried away, and he addresses the crowd of the Jews in the Hebrew language. He tells a little bit about his history, and you see, he's got a great Jewish pedigree. He studied at the feet of Gamaliel and other things that he talks about with his history. And then he recounts his conversion on the road to Damascus. We also read about that in Acts chapter 9 as well. So we can merge those two together and get a full understanding of what's going on. So as he's on his way to Damascus, he sees Jesus in a miraculous vision. You see, he went there to arrest Christians. Jesus stopped him along the way and tells him he needed to go into Damascus and there he would be told what he must do. This, during this vision, he was blinded by this bright light. 
So Paul obeyed, went into the city, and spent three days fasting and praying. We learn that from Acts chapter 9, verses 9 and verse 11. And we get to our text here in Acts 22. At that point, Ananias was sent by a vision to visit Paul. And he miraculously healed Paul's blindness that had struck him, struck him from the, uh, the bright light that he saw in the vision. And he told Paul that God had plans for him. He was going to be a messenger to all men. And that would include the Gentiles. You see, the original 12 were just mainly going to the Jews. But Paul would be the one to branch out and bring the message to the Gentiles. Notice with me, if you will, verse 16, very carefully. At this point, uh, Paul had already had a miraculous vision of Jesus. He had spent three days in fasting and prayer, and Ananias has a question for him. Why are you waiting? You see, there was something very important that Paul was putting off. The question that Ananias is asking him is making an important point. And right after that, he gives a command, arise and be baptized. You see, the point he was making was there needs to be some urgency to this because his sins weren't yet washed away. He needed to be baptized so that his sins would be washed. So what do we learn from this? Well, there's a few things that won't wash away our sins. A miraculous vision of Jesus, it's not going to wash away your sins. Didn't work for, for Paul, it's not going to work for you. Praying and fasting didn't work for Paul. Three days, he was fervently praying. He was fasting through, the, through that period. Still didn't wash away his sins. You see, if you want your sins washed away, you've got to do what Paul had to do and be baptized. What are you waiting for? Just like Ananias asked Paul, I'm asking you, what are you waiting for? You see, we have the chance to have our sins washed away. And that comes at the point of baptism. It's a critical step in the process. It's not the only thing, but it's an important thing to have your sins washed away. And that is good news for us today. Well, it's time to visit the workshop where Troy Spradlin will be repairing our understanding. Today, he's explaining what the gospel can't do. The Apostle Paul said the gospel is the power of God unto salvation in Romans chapter 1, verse 16. That means you can be saved from your sins and have the hope of eternal life in heaven if you obey the gospel. You see, God made it easy for anyone to have the precious gift that he offers. But as powerful as the gospel is, there are still some things that the gospel cannot do. Number one, the gospel cannot preach itself. You see, the word gospel means good news, but that precious news of Jesus Christ cannot broadcast itself. Instead, faithful disciples of the Lord have the responsibility of spreading the good news around the world according to commands found in Matthew 28, verse 19 and 20, and Mark 16, 15. And the pattern that God chose for the gospel to go out is simply ordinary people telling other ordinary people the extraordinary news of an extraordinary man, Jesus Christ. You see, God never intended for the good news of Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection to just stay on the pages of the Bible. He wants you and I to go tell others that good news. And God's way always works. Now, number two, the gospel cannot save someone if they're not willing to be saved. The gospel is how one gains access to salvation, the forgiveness of their sins, but the availability of that salvation is entirely conditional. And that's because one must choose to obey. See, God desires all men to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth in 1 Timothy 2, 4, but that doesn't mean He's going to force you against your will to do so. You know, you can lead someone to the truth and give them the good news, but 
The gospel itself can't save someone if they're not willing to follow the Bible pattern of the gospel. And that is believing the gospel, John 8, 24, repenting of their sins in Luke 13, 3, confessing Christ in Romans 10, 9, and being baptized into Christ as it says in Mark 16, 16. See, the power within the gospel can only save someone if they willingly choose to obey God's plan of salvation as presented in Scripture. Just like what Paul writes in Romans 6, 17, but God be thanked that though you were slaves of sin, yet you obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine which you were delivered. Now, number three, the gospel cannot take the place of faith. It is the gospel that produces faith. Faith comes by hearing and that good news of the word of God as we read in Romans 10, 17, and faith is indeed the proper response to the gospel message, but it does not stop with faith only. You see, James teaches us that believers must be doers of the word, not hearers only, James 1.22, and that faith works together with works, according to chapter 2, 22 and 24. A faith that pleases God is a faith that produces acts of obedience through love, like Galatians 5, 6 says. That means that just hearing and believing the good news of the gospel is not all that's required of us. Once someone hears the good news and submits to the will of God to be saved, accessing that power of the gospel, then they must live faithfully until death, says Revelation 2.10. That teaches us that the gospel is not a substitute for faith. Because indeed, it is impossible to be pleasing to God without faith, but that means that we are still required to give proof of our faith through obedience. So in conclusion, just like the Apostle Paul you and I should thank God for the power of the gospel and its ability to change people's lives. But let's not forget that there are some things that even the gospel cannot do. And let's remember that God has done His part by providing the good news and its power for all of mankind. So now, let us all do our part. Do your part and obey the gospel, because it won't preach itself. It won't save someone who doesn't want to be saved, and it won't take the place of faith. Thanks, Troy. We're about to give you our contact information. There's a couple of things you can do with it. You can sign up for our free Bible course that we offer through the mail. We'd love to have you enroll if you haven't done so already. You can also email us with any questions that you have. We'd love to answer those questions, and we may do so during one of our programs. Jim Dearman joins us in just a moment. You may have questions or comments about Good News Today. We'd like to hear from you. Or if you would like to receive free Bible study materials, please contact us. Our mailing address is Good News Today, P.O. Box 206, Dunlap, Tennessee, 37327. Again, that's Good News Today, P.O. Box 206, Dunlap, Tennessee, 37327. You may prefer to email us at goodnewstodaytv at gmail.com. That's goodnewstodaytv at gmail.com. Or call us toll free at 1 877 384 7221. That's 1 877 384 7221. We'd like to hear from you. Hearing from our audience is always good news to us. The easiest way to enroll in our Bible course is on our website at gnttv.org. Just click where it says Bible course, fill out the information, and we'll mail it to you. Did you know that Good News Today can be heard through our channel on truth.fm? That's a group of streaming radio stations that offer great biblical programming to anybody anywhere in the world. If you haven't done so already, check out truth.fm and look for the Good News Today channel. Now here's Jim Dearman with some sound words for us about baptism being a burial. We will live eternally if we obey sound words. Can you imagine standing by the gravesite of a beloved friend and following a moving eulogy, the preacher picks up a handful of dirt, throws it on the coffin, and everyone leaves, the burial completed? Well, surely no one would consider the burial finished until the casket was lowered into the ground and completely covered with dirt. Well, we're told in Scripture that baptism is a burial, though many in the religious world believe it's only sprinkling or pouring. 
Paul, the inspired apostle, wrote in Romans 6, 3 and 4, Or do you not know that as many of us as were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? Therefore, we were buried with him through baptism into death, that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. In Acts chapter 8, verses 38 and 39, we have a good example of baptism when Philip baptized the eunuch. The verses read, And both Philip and the eunuch went down into the water, and he baptized him. Now when they came up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord caught Philip away so that the eunuch saw him no more, and he went on his way rejoicing. Could it be any clearer that baptism is a burial in water? The New Testament was written in Greek, and the Greek word from which we get our English word baptism literally means immersion. There are different Greek words for sprinkling and pouring, and those words are never used in relation to baptism. Thanks for those excellent thoughts, Jim. Have you ever missed an episode of Good News Today and wish you could watch it? Here's a few ways you can do that through our website, Facebook, or YouTube. You could also download an app for your phone, your television, or your tablet. The program's there every Sunday, so you never have to miss an episode. It's time for us to head to the Pastime Porch, where Freddie Clayton is stopping by for a visit, and he's answering the question, who can be saved? If you get into a conversation about salvation with two religious folk today, the likelihood is high that you will be talking to two individuals who believe, practice, and teach two different things about the most fundamental of all subjects, and that is salvation. That fact is amazing. It's also frightening, and it's very discouraging. Remarkably, some have taught that salvation is not even available to all men, for God never intended for some people to be saved. Now, this doctrine is known as limited atonement, and it's advanced by many people. It holds that Christ only died for what is referred to as the elect. Thus, the atoning sacrifice to Christ was not for everybody, but just for this limited group of people. How does that doctrine hold up in light of the gospel? Is that what the gospel teaches? Is that what the Bible affirms? Can really anybody and everybody be saved according to the Scripture? Actually, the Scripture affirms that all need to be saved. There's no doubt about that. Paul wrote in Romans chapter 3, verse 23, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. In verse 10 of this same Romans chapter 3, we read, there is none righteous, no, not one. So since God is the one who gave us these Scriptures, Truly, he knows that all need to be saved. Would a loving, gracious God only offer salvation to a limited number and unconditionally condemn all others? No, Scripture affirms that God wants all to be saved. The two apostles we know the best affirm this through inspiration. God desires all men to be saved and come to knowledge of truth, 1 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 4. Peter in 2 Peter chapter 3 at verse 9 says, The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, but is long-suffering toward us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. God desires anyone and everyone to be saved. Now, that's not to say they're not conditioned. The Scripture also affirms that Jesus died for all to be saved. Is this not apparent throughout the New Testament? He died for all all, that he might taste death for everyone, Hebrews chapter 2 at verse 9, for the whole world, First John chapter 2 at verse 2, so that he might draw all peoples to himself, John 12 at verse 32, the free gift to all men, Romans chapter 5 verse 18. Yes, friend, Jesus died for all mankind. And Scripture also affirms that Jesus Call for all to be saved. That's why the invitation we read in Matthew chapter 11 is coming to me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I'll give you rest. Which doesn't cause us to be surprised when we read in Revelation chapter 22, verse 17, that the invitation 
is for whosoever will or whosoever desires to be saved. When the most important and fundamental subject of Scripture is studied, that is salvation, let's lay aside all man-made doctrines, go back to the Bible, and find God's way. The Bible's emphatic on this point. All means all, and every means every. Anyone can be saved, and that includes you, my friend. It takes the combination of faith, repentance, confession, and baptism by immersion to wash away your sins. Thanks, Freddie. Now, Chad Dalahai joins us for just a minute, and he's talking about Jesus and his connection to baptism. May I have just a minute of your time? Have you ever thought about things connected to Jesus? There are certain things connected to Jesus that men often attempt to sever. One such example would be baptism. People often debate about baptism today. Is it necessary to become a Christian? Is it necessary to go to heaven? The answer to both those questions, biblically, is yes. For you see, baptism is connected to Jesus. In Acts 8, Philip the evangelist preached Jesus to the nobleman from Ethiopia. But that led the man to ask to be baptized. Thus, to preach Jesus means we must preach baptism. Furthermore, baptism is into Jesus, according to Romans 6, 3, and 4, and it is into His name, according to Matthew 28, 19. If we try to sever salvation and becoming a Christian from scriptural baptism, then we're trying to sever something that is connected to Jesus Himself. As Brother Eddie Brinkley would say, Jesus and baptism are a package deal. I'm Chad Dalahite, and this is Just a Minute. Baptism and Jesus, they're inseparable. Earlier in that same chapter, Acts chapter 8, Philip preached things concerning the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ. And as a result, both men and women were baptized, verse number 12. So we see preaching Jesus results in baptism twice in Acts chapter 8. Thanks, Chad. In just a moment, we'll give our Bible question to Anthony and Troy. Yes, yes, said, truly, yes, said, how we should live now. What to partake, what to avoid, what here. Do unto those that are about a kindly service. Tell him of Christ, teach him that he always is near. Did you repent, fully repent, of your first sins, friend? When you confessed his name on heart, did you believe? Now we have a Bible question for Anthony and Troy. Does God forgive me even if I don't forgive myself? Does God forgive me even if I don't forgive myself is the question we have today. Wow. Well, first of all, that's uh, one of those questions that makes me kind of sad. Right. Um, and it makes me feel bad that uh, the person who asked the question, at least that's how I'm taking it, if they feel that way. Uh, but it's a serious question, one that I've received before. Mm -hmm. And many times I think of Paul as we go to uh, 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse right. 15, whenever Paul says, this is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptance, that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am chief. And right. so that kind of gives me the idea that there's something there that Paul was wrestling with, whether it be guilt, maybe he felt like he couldn't forgive himself. We don't know exactly how Paul felt, but there's something there. But Paul goes on to say, but for this reason, I obtained mercy. So yes, he sir. accepts the fact that uh, God does forgive. Right. You know, and that's something that we need to come to the conclusion of is that there's no amount of sins that you can commit that God is not willing to forgive. That's right. Uh, he's willing to forgive so long as we're willing to re repent of our sins. God is willing to forgive us of those things. Matthew 18, 21 through 22, he, he tells us, as Paul, Peter asked, how many times shall we forgive another? You know, and um, the Lord's response is till 70 times seven. Mm -hmm. The idea is not that you count 
do the multiplication for that uh, number to see what how many times you forgive somebody. But the idea is that you continuously try to forgive people so long as they have a heart that's willing to apologize and to repent of the wrong in which they've done. Absolutely. And another thing, too, I mean, there's a couple of things, if I may, just give some some mm-hmm. brief advice. And that is, number one, we need to, as Paul says, we need to humble ourselves. You know, that's the to think that God can't forgive you or you can't forgive yourself. It, it's kind of taking it out of, of God's hands. But another thing that really helps is to confess that sin you're struggling with, because right. when you confess it, you get it out of yourself yes. and you take away Satan's power. Uh, because no longer can Satan use that to try to torment you or anything else. And it's now been shared with someone else. Excellent. Great point. And, and you know, another side to this that I thought about is sometimes when tragedies happen yes. in people's lives, yes. do they go on the other side where they felt as though maybe I lost a loved one yeah. and I felt as though I could have done something more to prevent that situation. And so therefore I can't forgive my, you don't feel like you can forgive yourself in that situation. Though you might ask God to forgive you and be with you, you just still feel some mm-hmm. kind of guilt. Um, and maybe that might be something that they're talking about. But what we do know is that we can always lean on God. Amen. And he promised he'll always be there for us. He'll always be there with us. We can accomplish all things through him, Philippians 4.13. Uh, and we just have to keep in mind that, there's no sin that God is uh, unwilling to forgive us of. The only sin that he won't forgive us of is the sin that is unrepented of. And that is such an important point. And amen. Thanks, guys. Any sin can be forgiven. We just have to do what God says to do for that forgiveness. During this episode, there's been a lot of information about what the Bible teaches about baptism. If you haven't done that, just like you read in the Bible, what are you waiting for? I encourage you, go through the book of Acts, see exactly what they were instructed to do, do what they did, and become what they became, a Christian. Nothing more, nothing less. What are you waiting for? If you need to hear those scriptures again, to check it against your copy of the scriptures, you can do that through our website, through our apps, or through our podcast. You have a question, contact us and we'll answer it. Know that we love you, we're praying for you, and we want you to make it to heaven. There is good news today all around the world. Good news, good news, the world. always good news. Good news, good news, there is good news today. There is good news, good news, the world. always good news. Good news, good news, there is good news today, all around the world, good news, good news, always good news, good news, good news, there is good news today.